twins, um, and one of them was very sad, I started to look into animal communication to try to understand what was wrong with him. And uh, and it was through that that I started to realize that, hey, <laughs> what's coming through me is a lot different from what's coming through my friends who are studying and working with me alongside me for six years. So um, I don't mean to go on. You can ask. No, no, please, no, please do. No, please do. <laughs> we, we like when you go on. We like <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to share our experiences along with what you're talking about, so please do. Okay, okay. So, um, as I said, I, I had really hidden that for, for a very long time. I mean, when I was when I was very young, when I was I guess six, almost seven, um, my parents sent, I kept telling them that I didn't want to go into the bathroom and take a bath or shower or brush my teeth. I was very frightened of doing that because there was a dead woman in the bathtub, and they sent me to a Freudian psychoanalyst, one of the few in the United States at the time. Oh my God! It was a long time ago. Who who, who uh, took children and worked with children? And of course, what he said was that I was afraid of losing my dirt, which I thought was really bizarre. And um, you know, he said that my um, you know that I was too creative. My uh, uh, I was making up these stories, and uh, I'd be sorry one day because you know I was just too capable of <laughs> doing uh, saying unusual things, and I. I didn't know what to make of it. I was seven, but I learned that I needed to keep my mouth shut or else people were going to give me pills or, you know, do other things and send me to this guy who really didn't know what he was talking about. Um, You know, I had friends who nobody else saw and all that kind of thing. So um, anyway, when I was 40 and I was starting to study animal communication, um, after studying for several months with 25 other people or 24 other people, um, we all graduated, finished, and seven of us started our own group, and we met every couple of weeks for five, uh, almost six years, um, working together, just you know, training on on the communicating. And um, let's uh, let's back- actually backtrack. Let's actually backtrack a little because we'll get to that. We'll get to your development and and you know your sure. your later years. A little bit longer, but uh, you know, Chris and I can both speak to this experience. Uh, I had my first. I, I mean, I've been sensitive to stuff uh, since as as far back as I can remember. My first conscious experience of disembodied mm-hmm. spirit was I was seven years old and in my uh, parents' apartment in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, whom I was very close with, uh, appeared before me smiled, lingered for a few seconds, and then sort of faded away. And I went into the living room Mm. and told my mother and father that Grandpa was here. And they said, oh, you're imagining things again, because I was one of those, I was one of those quote-unquote kids with an overactive imagination, which I'm sure you can relate to, Eden. That's what they call mine, too. Yes, thank you. And until three minutes later, when the phone rang, and it was my grandmother saying my grandfather had passed. So, you know, even even with that acknowledgement, they still never accepted the fact that I, I had these abilities. Chris? Well, you know, it, it, it's weird because I had these abilities when I was really young, and I didn't even realize it. Um, we had a friend, I had a friend come on our other show last week, and, and he was saying how he used to come over my house when we were like, you know, eight years old, and, and he would call his parents in the middle of the night to come pick him up because I was scaring him. I have no recollection of that. So I really don't. I don't remember it. It's amazing. And I have a few friends that have told me that now. And that was like when I was seven and eight years old. It wasn't until I was about 10 that spirit actually, in my memory, what I remember, spirit actually coming to me when I was about 10. And, you know, I, I got to say, my, um, my family thought I was crazy, you know, because I was seeing somebody walk around the house. My brother and my sisters were terrified. You know, everyone was sleeping in my parents' bed, including me, the big chooch. And, um, you know, I, I just I didn't want to be the freak. And I mean, I've said this many times on the show. Um, it, it wasn't what I wanted for myself, you know. And then as I, I had gotten, you know, I, I asked Spirit to leave me alone when I was about 13, and they did, because I really wanted to concentrate on being a ball player. And, you know, I, this might sound, you know, Whatever, but I wanted to be popular, and I didn't think you could be popular talking to dead people. Not back then, anyway. Today, you'd be, you know, you'd be the bell of the ball. But back then, you were just a freak. <laughs> so, so I, I begged them to leave me, oh, and about yeah. 
2013, they did. And then you want to know what happened? Something crazy happened. I have a cousin who's pretty famous, John Edwards, and, you know, he embraced it. When I pushed it away, he embraced it, and he became, you know, John Edwards, the psychic that everyone knows, and I went in, you know, and I went, uh, you know, about my life just pushing it away, not, you know, acknowledging it or trying not to, and little by little, little by little, it would, like, infiltrate my life here and there and give me, like, little signs, and I would push it away. I'd be like, no, leave me alone. I don't, I don't want to be part of that, you know. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be John Edwards, you know. So mm-hmm. it wasn't until I got married and, and I had my second child that spirit came back to me full force, and they basically said, you know what, you're a dumbass. Because you could be as good as anybody if you want to be, but you you wasted your life going into the military, trying to be a baseball player, blah, 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 blah. Where are you? You've been good at everything, but never quite good enough. You know what? We're going to teach you, and you're going to accept who and what you are, or we're going to haunt you for the rest of your life. And it was at that moment that I said, okay, teach me. And that's basically my story in a nutshell. You know, I, I just, love it. You, it's so it's so nice to hear that because it, it starts to make me feel so much, you know, more normal. I, I identify think, so well with it. I I think all of us who were born quote unquote open, um, or born with the ability to recognize that we had senses that other people might not have developed at that age, um, struggled mm-hmm. in some way. I know it was very hard for me to make friends when I was a kid. Um, uh, being yep. uh, being isolated, uh, often being on my own, uh, uh, teachers calling me a daydreamer, which actually I learned later I was meditating, um, and, and, and just <laughs> not really connecting with the things that the kids that back then were into. And I'm just wondering, what was what was it like with your friends as a, as a child? Not, forget about your family. What was it like with your friends? For me, um, it yeah. was a similar kind of thing. And, and I had other strikes against me, too, because... Um, a lot of people in my family were very well known um, in the film industry and and uh, that kind of thing. So we always had this very uh, crazy, exciting life going on, and and uh, and you know, just oh my gosh. So uh, it was it was difficult because I would see things, and once in a while I would tell my friends, and then they would get scared, or we'd all be scared because we'd be somewhere where it was haunted, and I would be hearing things, and things would be happening, and and. Uh, at school, yeah, I mean, I, I identify with what you were saying too, Chris, and, and both of you, because uh, they were telling me, uh, the headmaster, when I finally graduated um, high school, said that uh, I relied way too much on my intuition, and I didn't even know what that was. I was sort of, huh? You know, <laughs> and and I would tell people that so-and-so was bad, you know, don't don't hang around this person or, you know, don't have this person in my house, mom and dad, because this person's bad. And, you know, they would laugh at me or my father would call me a witch, which totally frightened me because I mm. thought of the Wizard of Oz and, the, you know, that horrible <laughs> hat and the green nose. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, and, and then as growing up, I mean, for me, I would know things, but I didn't know that I knew them because it was – I thought everybody knew the same things that I did, and I didn't understand. It, it Actually, I, I finally, um, I mean, not that I haven't gone to therapy before because I really needed it after that, but um, I went to a, a therapist a while ago to try to find out what parts of me or my life or my understanding were like the normal average kind of person things and what were the psychic medium things. And she was so interested in all my stories and and that sort of thing that she really wasn't very helpful. (laughs) Um, But it it was very hard, and it was really difficult. I I didn't know anything different, but, you know, growing up in in homes that were haunted was was really unpleasant at times as they weren't haunted by nice people most of the time and nice spirits. And my, um, my parents, of course, you know, kept, saying they were, they were ignoring it and pushing it aside. So I didn't know what to do. And as a teenager, when my a lot of my friends started coming over, they would say, what's going on here? How come, you know, somebody's yelling? You know, why are your parents having a fight in the middle of the night? And it wasn't my parents. And we'd have house guests. My parents would have people come in all the time and, and stay. And, you know, they'd see people walking around at night. And, you know, you'd hear footsteps and doors opening and closing. And, oh, worse. I mean, it just went crazy. So um, uh, I, I was 
you know, very disturbed by all of that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it took a while. As I said, I mean, I told my husband that, uh, before we got more involved, when I first met him, I said, "You know what? If you don't <laughs> listen to me, <laughs> the only reason and I'm I tell you, I, I scripted all these <laughs> questions, and you're like ten questions ahead of us right now." <laughs> I just want to say, you know, it, it, it's interesting, questions. you know, you, how you're saying, you know, you're telling your husband, you better believe me. You, you know, yeah. this reminds me of a story. In fact, I've never told this story. You want to know why? Because it came to me now for the first time in all these years. <laughs> you know, when yeah. my, my father was a huge supporter of me and everything I, I ever did. And when I came out as a psychic, you know, 10 years ago, he was my biggest supporter. He was my biggest fan. He pushed me. He believed in me. He was so proud of me. When awesome. now let me go back to when I was 15. I remember being uh, we were playing um, in in a in a baseball game. I was playing for my high school, which is Wagner High School, and we were playing in the city championships at Shea Stadium. And um, my father was in the front row, and I'm in the batter's box, and it's like the I don't know like the fifth inning or whatever. And it's amazing I'm even remembering. I can't believe I blocked this out of my mind for all these years. And I and I'm talking. To to a baseball player standing right next to me who really wasn't there. Well, he was for me. Else. I love it. And I remember my father. My father looked at me. He goes, Chris. And I turned around and looked. He goes, What are you doing? And I just I said, Oh my God, I'm 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 talking out loud. I didn't realize that I was talking out loud to a spirit. So I kind of like back up towards my father a little bit. I was maybe I don't know like ten feet from him. And he says, What did he say to you? He said he's going to throw me a first pitch curveball. My father goes, he hasn't thrown a curveball all game. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to listen to him. I remember I get up. Now, this kid did not throw a curveball all freaking game. My father was right. He didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. I went up there looking for a first pitch curveball. The kid threw me a first pitch curveball. I hit a double in the gap and knocked in three runs. And here I am thinking to myself, holy shit, this, this could be something good for me. But you know what? <laughs> but that was the last time it happened, really, that I can remember until later into my Air Force years. But it's funny that that just came back to me. That's yeah, a great story. yeah, yeah. It, it really is, and it, you know, I, know. I love it because you know, my father, my father was like this great guy. He was really, he was my father was me only older, really funny, and you know, everyone loved him. And you know, when when he said something, people stopped and listened all the time. Mm. And when he he yelled at me, and I I knew that that yell, and I turned around really quick, and he just looked at me, he's like, "What are you doing with that face that he used to make?" And I was like, "Oh my God, I'm." I'm I'm talking to a dead person. That's what I'm doing. But I couldn't say it. It was just like crazy. And, you know, I, I'm actually glad I had that experience now that I think about it. You know, the funny, mm. thing is, the funny thing is, is that I've often actually done that. I've sort of semi-tranced out and had conversations. And then people who were around me at the time will come over and say, who are you talking to? Or yep. my wife will say, "My wife will say, you're 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 there again. You're not here. You're there again." And uh, this recognition of the fact that this, this is happening. Do you ever do that? Even do you ever sort of zone away and go into conversation? I do, but you know, m most often it's not really zoning out for me, which is kind of funny because um, I'll be standing with someone, and um, either I'll get a chill or I'll just you know I'll start hearing they're telling me something. You know, one of my guys is saying something. Or it's somebody for that person I'm with, which doesn't happen as often because I ask not to have that happen. Right. Um, but, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I used to worry and, again, keep that in. And now I just, you know, do talk and, and uh, I'm shaking my head and telling, you know, saying, yes, yes, I'm agreeing. Okay, I'll tell them, you know. <laughs> Right. What Absolutely. is going on? <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to say that you're listening to Second Sight Radio on the DTM Wicked Radio Network. Our guest tonight is animal communicator and psychic medium, Eden Scott Cross. And Eden, please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and the work that you do. Well, I have a Facebook page, and that is my first name and last name, Eden Cross, comma, animal communicator. Um, I'm working on a website. I hope to have it up by the end of the year. But because I am still a full-time interior designer, mm, people have to be a little bit more understanding. It takes me a little longer to get things like that going. Um, plus, I've only been uh, 
outed for the last four years. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's I like funny. that outed. Yeah, right. Walked out of the closet, huh? <laughs> 